everybody for joining us today. We're, we're really welcoming the opportunity to present to the most important stakeholders uh, today. We've done a lot of presentations and calls, but this is the most important one, uh, patients and families living with SHD. Um, I'm happy to, to uh, just quickly introduce, because we want to spend the bulk of our time talking about the data and really going through that. So I'm happy to pro um, um, introduce Chris Morbido, Chief Medical Officer, over here to my left. Uh, Michelle Melian, Senior Medical Director, Clinical Development. Alejandro Rojas, Associate Director of Biology. And you'll see on your screen, Anthony Acorsi, Senior Scientist and Head of Muscle Biology. Um, so today they're gonna be presenting the Lismapamod Redux for data and providing other relevant information. We then have an opportunity at the end for questions from the community regarding just this data presentation. We have an intent to interact with the agency with the FDA, which will inform future study designs. So at this time, we're unable to answer questions about the regulatory pathway or the timing or design of the next study. We are, however, excited to answer data-related questions. Of course, there may not be time for all of those questions. So please keep connected with June and myself and the FSH Society for information about a follow-up uh, virtual Fulcrum Patient Day next month. I've also been provided some community questions ahead of time, which we will hopefully try to cover. But again, we may not have time for all of the questions uh, that we've gotten in today. So I'm gonna turn things over to Chris to get this uh, kicked off. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Jen. Uh, and thank you all uh, people living with FSHD and uh, participants in the study. I also wanna thank Dr. Rabi Tawil, who's here with us today, who uh, treats uh, maybe some of you um, and uh, was our primary principal investigator for the Redux 4 study. Um, if you go to the next slide, I'll just provide a little bit of an introduction before I pass it over to the team to present uh, these really exciting uh, data. So Fulcrum is a biotechnology company that's based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We focus on uh, difficult challenges. We focus on genetically defined rare diseases, and we do so with uh, conviction and perseverance. And it's, it's with the work that this team has done over the last few years that we get to a point like this, which is um, a potentially transformational uh, uh, data that um, we think are going to uh, have big impacts on, on people living with FSHD. So you've heard a little bit about the results, I'm sure by now, and we're gonna spend some time walking through those results in a little more detail. And then obviously have time for questions and answers at the end. So Michelle, I'll pass it back to you. Thanks, Chris. So I think that um, some of you may be familiar uh, with Los Mapamod. And Los Mapamod is a selective P38 alpha beta map kinase inhibitor. And basically what Los Mapamod did, does is it inhibits the activity of P38 map kinase, alpha and beta, and reduces the phosphorylization of these substrates, including HSP27 and other proteins that result in the regulation of duct spore expression. Los Mapamod has already been tested in several clinical studies previously, and we are very fortunate to have this large safety database and has demonstrated across over 3,500 study participants uh, favorable safety and tolerability in over 25 clinical trials. It's been in uh, over 30 countries and has 11 uh, and been tested in uh, over 11 different target indications in adults. And what Los Mapamod does is what we're showing here is that it inhibits P38, thus shutting off the duct spore pathway. And so, based on what we know about Los Mapamod, our hypothesis was, was that losmapamod could modify the course of FSHD and does this by reducing FSHD-related muscle degeneration through the reduction of myotoxic duct spore, leading to decreased muscle fat replacement, improving function or preserving function, and that, this, that these improvements are recognized uh, by patients through our patient quality of life questionnaires. For those of you that are not familiar uh, with our clinical development program, Fulcrum has had a very comprehensive clinical development program and preparing for, our, uh, for this clinical study. Over the last several years, we have completed several full preparatory studies in which we've refined clinical endpoints, including our primary endpoint, that being DUX4, which we evaluated in muscle needle biopsies, as well as our whole body MRI protocol in which we look at muscles in their entirety, as well as looking at different 
muscle function measurements, uh, clinical outcome assessments, and also making those clinical outcome assessments more suitable to evaluate FSHD patients, as well as evaluating different patient reported outcomes. We showed you last year in our phase one study that losmapamod was in fact safe and tolerable in FSHD subjects and does engage the target and penetrates muscle in patients with FSHD. We also have an ongoing phase two open label study going on at a single site in the Netherlands at Raboud, in which we're continuing to look at different endpoints such as the molecular endpoint, the duct score endpoint, as well as looking at the MRI assessments and other clinical assessments of mobility. And this has helped to inform us and our evaluation of the data that is coming from Redux4 and that we are sharing with you today. And so when we were thinking about how this data would look and what we were trying to find out from this 48-week study, we were trying to think about what potential changes we could see. As you all very well know, FSHD is a disease that progresses over decades. And during these decades, there is an accumulation of disability that happens over time. And you can see here that there is a downward slope of a line representing the progression of disease with on the y-axis going from 100% function to wheelchair bound and on the x-axis being the time. And the idea here is for us to look for ways in which we can actually change the trajectory of this disease or change the slope of the disease progression, if you will. So you can see here on our hypothetical plot, we have on the horizontal axis, the number of days over time, and the, on the y-axis percent change. And what we're trying to do is change that axis, the blue line representing the natural history group or the placebo group, and change that slope of the line with los mapamod treatment to the orange line as treated by los mapamod. So Redux4 was designed to capture a wide range of FSHD disease progression. It is the largest, most comprehensive clinical trial of FSHD run to date. And in thinking about this clinical trial, we encompassed as many different endpoints to interrogate as we possibly could from the molecular endpoint in looking at and evaluating duct spore gene expression to building upon our safety database with adding additional safety and tolerability data, as well as being sure that the, that the pharmacokinetics, meaning that the concentration of los mapamod is able to be detected in the organ of interest, that being muscle, uh, is detectable and that it's working in that organ of interest. Because we knew that the molecular endpoint had not been in a clinical study before, we wanted to be sure that we had other ways to measure the potential efficacy of los mapamod in Redux4. So we purposefully added structural measures of MRI. We have an optimized or a full body, whole body MRI protocol uh, in which we measure muscle fat infiltration, muscle fat fraction, and lean muscle volume. And we also included functional outcome measurements, such as reachable workspace, dynamometry, timed up a go, and motor function measure, as well as patient reported outcomes. And we will go through each of these shortly. So looking at the Redux4 trial design, Redux4 was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial in which patients were enrolled at one-to-one -to, -one to either placebo uh, or los mapamod after a 28-day screening period. We were able to enroll a total of 80 patients, 40 patients in each group. And initially, the trial was designed as a 24-week trial with the primary endpoint of duct spore activity in muscle needle biopsies with our secondary endpoints of safety in PK, our whole body muscle MRI, and our exploratory endpoints of multiple clinical outcome assessments and also patient reported outcomes. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we had, to, we had to extend the study in order to enable collection of data to inform all of our endpoints. And so we increased the study from 24 to 48 weeks to allow appropriate collection of data to inform these important endpoints. Whether patients rolled over at 24 weeks or, are, or at 48 weeks, all patients were offered the ability to enroll in the open label extension study, and 99% of patients elected to enroll into this study. 
So in this study, as I said, our primary endpoint was looking at duct spore driven gene expression uh, in muscle biopsies by looking at the expression of several different genes that are associated with duct spore. Uh, and Alejandro Rojas will uh, go over that data with you, as well as we looked at a whole body musculoskeletal MRI, which provided us with structural assessments of muscles uh, throughout the whole body, not just the lower extremities, but upper extremities and also including the torso. And we included several different clinical outcome assessments, including the timed up and go, in which patients start from a sitting position, stand up, walk three meters, and then return the three meters and then sit back down. We also included FSHD tug, which is a slightly modified version of the timed up and go, in which we have patients start from a supine position, go to a sitting position, then do the tug as I just described and go back to a supine position. We also had multiple measures of dynamometry, which is a measure of muscle strength, including several different muscles, such as your shoulder AB ductors, elbow flexion and extension, as well as um, the muscle that lifts up your ankle called, uh, or your ankle dorsiflexors or tibialis anterior. We included another measure called reachable workspace, which is a measure of upper extremity function. And we also included the motor function the motor function measurement domain one, which is a measurement of standing and transfers. It's a composite measurement that some of you may be familiar with in which we have you do several different exercises such as standing and running and score you on how well you do on those exercises. Yeah. Oops, sorry. Additionally, we included, um, we wanted to know how people were feeling during the clinical trial. This was uh, the patient reported outcomes, and we included the patient's global impression of change, or the PGIC, uh, which is a single question that we asked at every single visit except the baseline visit, saying, since the start of the study, my overall status is, and you filled out on a Likert scale of one to seven, one being very much improved, seven being very much worse, how you were feeling at that time of, uh, at that time of the visit. And we also included the FSHD health index, uh, which, is a, um, which is a patient reported outcome of 114, I'm sorry, 116 questions, of, including di 14 different domains. So now to the results. So as I said previously, we enrolled 80 uh, subjects uh, in four different countries uh, and at 17 different sites that they were the, both um, uh, the placebo and the Los Mathemod arms were extremely well balanced with the average age of approximately 46 years old. <laughs> the body mass index was also very well balanced being approximately uh, 26 kilograms per meter squared. And this population is representative of what we see in FSHD1. You can see here that two uh, subjects uh, in the placebo group discontinued as well as one patient in the Los Mapamod group discontinued in the trial, and they discontinued in this trial not for reasons not related to the study drug. On this slide, we're showing how well Los Mapamod performed uh, on uh, PK or pharmacokinetic and target engagement assessments. And PK is essentially looking at the concentration that is needed for a clinical effect in your body. And we know from our preclinical studies, if you look here at this top graph here, on the bottom is each visit, and we measured uh, the amount of uh, Los Mapamod uh, in blood at each visit, and this is the concentration in your blood. And what we wanted to be sure was, was that concentration stayed at the level at which we think that we need, we, Los Mapamod needs to be at in order to have an effect on the disease. And you can see here throughout the study that this red line, these measures of Los Mapamod stay above this orange line, which means that the concentration of Los Mapamod stayed above the level which we think we needed uh, for clinical efficacy. Additionally, um, the, we looked at this in muscle and it was the same uh, for muscle that the muscle exposures were also within the expected range for clinical efficacy. And we also see here on this bottom graph here, this is time on the bottom, and this is looking at the percent change from placebo, that Los Mapamod is in fact doing its job um, by engaging its target, which is 
and represented here by phospho HSP27. So you can see here that there is good target engagement of about 35 to 65%, which is what we had seen previously in our phase one study, as well as our preclinical studies is what was needed for clinical efficacy. So we're confident that losmapamod was in the target organ and was actually working within that target organ, that being the muscle. Additionally, losmapamod was well tolerated, as we had seen before in many previous, previous studies. Um, in the losmapamod group, 29 patients uh, reported uh, uh, adverse events or what we call side effects. Um, and 23 placebo patients reported these adverse events. This could be anything, um, usually uh, in this clinical trial was uh, more related uh, to headaches or belly pain. And so we, um, we, we, um, we record all of these different types of what we call adverse events. All of these adverse events um, were mild or moderate and did not lead to treatment discontinuation or study withdrawal. None of the events led to deaths and no deaths occurred during the trial. We had what we call three serious adverse events, and these are adverse events that means that people went into the hospital or had uh, significant um, issues, um, and um, whether it's related to study drug or not, these are reported. For these three adverse events, they were not related. Um, they were assessed as not being related to study drug and were related to, one was related to a post-op wound infection and another was related to alcohol poisoning and a suicide attempt in another participant. We did not see any significant changes in vital signs, laboratory studies, or EKG, uh, which is consistent with what has been shown previously in over 3,500 subjects exposed to at least one dose of los mapamod. So we'll move on to the evaluation of the biomarker, and I'll turn this over to Alejandro. Thanks, Michelle. I will now tell you uh, a little bit about the rationale on how do we determine uh, drugs for driven gene expression in muscle biopsies. So next, I'll like um, one of the challenges on determining um, DOCS4 expression is that um, DOCS4 expression is a stochastic and it happens on um, a subgroup of myofibers in, in the muscle of FSHD. In this cartoon on the left, you can see um, these represented as areas of high DOCS4 activity or, duct or, or low DOCS4 activity in affected muscle. Also, different muscles in an in individual with FSHD have different ducts for expression levels and patterns. So every muscle has a, a different uh, um, uh, composition uh, in terms of ducts for expression. To resolve this, we use uh, uh, an MRI method to guide us to these areas that uh, we thought are high um, chance of uh, measuring ducts for activity. And, and this is what we call the steer signal that is associated with the composition of water and the inflammation happening in a muscle, um, which we and others have demonstrated that are related to ducts for activity. Um, this, also, um, uh, this muscle also uh, now shows uh, other components of, of the FSHD, FSHD pathology uh, as <coughs> immune infiltration or adipose tissue infiltration. In, in, this, uh, in this trial, um, we use two biopsies, uh, one to determine baseline levels of DAX4 activity um, that we guided through this MRI method to these areas of high DAX4 expression. In the second biopsy was attempting to get to a, a site as close as possible to the first biopsy to capture um, a similar area of uh, the muscle in, in, in the trial. Go to the next slide. So now that we know how to how do we take the sample to analyze, um, I'm going to step back a little bit and, and, and explain why did we choose to measure DUX4 driven gene expression. DUX4, um, DUX4 aberrant expression of DUX4 in a skeletal muscle is the root cause of FSHD, and it's present at very low amounts in the FSHD muscle. DUX4 uh, in its normal function um, activates the expression of other genes. Um, during the early processes in the embryo development. These target genes now in FSHD that should not be in the muscle are expressing the muscle in FSHD. And um, the consequence of this is that now there is uh, myofiber death because these targets should not, or these proteins should not be uh, expressing the muscle. Measuring these DUX4 target gene expression can tell us about the amount of DUX4 in the muscle. And that's what we're measuring in this, um, in this trial. Go to the next slide. So then we um, uh, develop a very sensitive RT-qPCR assay 
um, to measure six of the um, uh, genes that DAX4 is regulating. DAX4 regulates many other genes, but we have determined that these six genes uh, are a good representation of DAX4 presence. We um, perform this analysis, as, a, as I mentioned, uh, as, as a baseline and post-baseline. And as uh, Michelle mentioned, some um, um, subjects in this, in this participants in the study um, um, had their second biopsy at week 16 or at week 36, uh, once um, the protocol was amended to a uh, 48-week study. Go to the next slide. So in the trial, um, uh, we use this measurement as our primary endpoint, and we could not detect, uh, we could not observe any um, differences uh, or change in the treatment period, and the primary endpoint was not met. Subgroup analysis by quartile expression of, um, uh, by quartile of DOX4 driven gene expression levels show also no differences. Um, DOX4 though, uh, was, DOX4 gene expression was highly variable in both groups. And here uh, in, 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 in this slide on the left, you see the heterogeneity on, on these um, values. These, um, these values here, so the, every, every dot on this, um, on this graph now shows uh, a, a single measurement on a single muscle biopsy, either at time zero, which is baseline, or week 16 or week 36. And what you can see is that this signal spans over 1,000 fold differences in between those biopsies that were taken that had the lowest levels of DOX4 driven gene expression to the ones that had the highest levels of, gene, uh, of DOX4 driven gene expression. We believe that this variability, um, did not, this variability does not that allow us to now measure a difference in, in this trial using this method. Despite um, the challenges of measuring um, DOX4, um, Michelle will tell you now about some of the important results in other clinical and, and patient reported outcomes. Thank you, Ale. So um, now we're gonna talk about the outcomes on the whole body musculoskeletal uh, MRI measure. And as Alejandro alluded to is that despite the challenges of measuring DOX4 in our muscle needle biopsies, we do observe downstream effects of DOX4 reduction on our structural and on our functional measures. And as I had alluded to before, um, with our new um, MRI, whole body MRI protocol that we developed with our partner AMRA, we are now moving from a point in which we are looking at single slices of muscle that you can see here uh, in this image here, um, to looking at the whole muscle uh, or muscles in their entirety and being able to rate these muscles, if you will, um, based on their severity. And so we can actually, by looking at these muscles in their entirety and evaluating them uh, based on their severity, pick out those muscles that have a high likelihood of progression. And the reason why it is important to look at those muscles that are most likely to progress is because this is where we believe we will have the highest uh, capability of detecting a treatment effect. But as you well know, uh, FSHD is very, has inter and intra patient heterogeneity. So another, another issue or um, challenge uh, that this protocol helps to solve for us is identifying those muscles in different patients that are most likely to progress. And we can actually have almost a personalized set of muscle for each patient to follow uh, in the clinical trial and be sure that we are looking or enriching the population that we are looking at to assess uh, the potential for efficacy. For our imaging protocol, uh, we imaged uh, patients uh, in their uh, neck, torso, and legs, and then repositioned them, had them shimmy over to one side of the MRI to get their upper arm, and then to the other side of the MRI to get their other arm. And the total examination took about 30 minutes. Once we acquired the images uh, for the MRI, we then, uh, we then um, evaluated them with a, with, and got a holistic and quantitative picture of muscle health by looking at these three different metrics. The first metrics being muscle fat infiltration, which is an indicator of muscle quality. Another metric, which is muscle fat 
fraction, which is a measurement of overall fattiness of the muscle, and also lean muscle volume, which is a measurement of the amount of lean or contractile muscle tissue. By looking at these different metrics, we were able to categorize and again, capture the heterogeneity of FSHD and also understand the severity of disease for each patient. And so what we did was, was based on these metrics uh, is we categorize muscles as normal appearing or A muscles here in green, as intermediate or B muscles here in yellow, and as end stage or C muscles here in this pinkish red. And you can see here that each of these avatars represent a patient in redux four, and that the severity and number of muscles that they have that are most likely to progress or normal varies between each patient. But this gives us a great idea of the severity um, that each patient is experiencing, but again, also allows us to identify those muscles highly likely to progress so that we can assess the potential for a treatment effect. And so when we look at these muscles that are most likely to progress or these intermediate or B muscles, what we see is, is that those Mapamod treated participants showed significantly less muscle fat infiltration that versus placebo. So what we are showing here is that uh, we have Los Mapamod in orange and placebo in blue. On the y-axis is you have the changes from baseline in percentage points at 48 weeks. And you can see here that there is a lot less muscle fat infiltration in the Los Mapamod group or significantly less that we see in the placebo group over the 48 week period. And muscle fat infiltration is the most proximal <laughs> measure uh, to uh, the disease pathology in that it looks at how much fat is in those functional units of muscle. Coming over here to muscle fat fraction, it's sort of like a click up. So you're going from these functional units of muscle to taking a look at the whole muscle in, that, um, in, that, uh, uh, in, in its entirety and looking at the, then all of the fat in the muscle. And you can see here that when we take a look at all of the fat in the muscle, uh, again, Los Mapamod is in orange and placebo is in blue, and we have the change in percentage points from baseline at 48 weeks, you can see that there is a trend or a decrease in fat accumulation as we measure it by this fat fraction. So essentially, we're seeing slowing of progression on fat accumulation in those muscles treated by Los Mapamod. And we know from prior studies that fat accumulation has a significant effect on muscle function. We did not see any effect on lean muscle volume, but this might take a longer time to see. And so we anticipate that we will learn more about the effect of Los Mapamod on lean muscle volume as we continue to collect data in our open label extension. So we not only looked at those muscles that are at high risk of progression, but we also looked at those normal appearing muscles. And again, we looked at those three, three measurements to give us an idea of muscle health, that holistic picture that we're trying to get to understand. And what we see here is we see little or no fat accumulation in the Los Mapamod group as compared to the placebo group. And again, we do not see any effect on lean muscle volume. In addition to these structural um, outcomes, we also measured several different clinical outcome assessments, and we will go through that data now. So the first being the reachable workspace, which is, which, uh, is a measure that evaluates upper arm and shoulder function. Um, this is essentially red evaluation of global upper extremity function, including uh, the shoulder and the arm. And basically you can see here, let's see if I can get this to play so that everybody can see what reachable workspace is. Oh, it doesn't look like I can get it to play. So what happens is, is that this patient sits, you can see this patient sitting in front of the computer screen and they're sitting in front of the Microsoft Connect sensor, which captures the movements of this patient and they undergo a standardized upper extremity movement protocol. Um, and this evaluation is performed with and with, without weights and has been shown to be reliable and sensitive to change. And the output that you get is this output that we call the relative surface area um, of these, what we're showing here is uh, four 
quadrants. There's also a quadrant number five, which is reaching behind. So you uh, follow this uh, protocol so that we can see how the arm moves in these three and in, in these uh, quintants, since there are five. And so when we evaluate the, uh, the function of the patients, we look at these, in this case, we're showing the four quadrants and we measure uh, the reachable, uh, the relative surface area of each of these quadrants. And together, all of these quadrants, including the one behind adds up to 1.25. And you can see here that on the left with no weight, there is certainly more, you can certainly reach more, but then when we stress your system with weight, um, they can see here that the deficit that you have um, becomes more apparent. And so very typically we have things in our hands like a cup um, or a plate. And so um, to know how your arm functions uh, with this weight is very, uh, is, is very important. And we do know that this measure correlates to activities of daily living. So when we take a look at this measurement of how your arm functions and reaches around these um, areas, what we do see here in this upper graph uh, here is on the horizontal line here, you can see the um, absolute changes in that surface area. And here you can see this is non-dominant versus dominant. Again, placebo is in blue, Los Mapamod is in orange. And you can see here that with no weight at 48 weeks, that there's a relative preservation of function, whereas um, the placebo group is actually seemingly losing total surface area. And then when we stress the system with that 500 gram weight, we actually see this difference brought out by challenging the system. And we can actually see that there is a significant difference um, between uh, that dominant and non-dominant arm. And actually we see an improvement with treatment in the Los Mapamod group as compared to the placebo group. So this correlates to the placebo group losing about two to 4% of the total surface area, whereas the Los Mapamod group is actually showing trends of slower disease progression, as well as movements of up to one and a half percent in the surface area with weight. And then when we take a look at uh, handheld dynamometry, this is a way that we measure upper and lower extremity strength in FSHD patients, and it's, this is quantitative, and we looked at limbs bilaterally. Trained physical therapists performed this measures, and we looked at your shoulder AV ductors, your elbow flexion and extension, as well as your ankle moving up and down, and your grip. And so when we took a look at the dynamometry, again, on the horizontal line here, you have the percent change at week 48. And you can see here that the Los Mapamod group uh, had, a, had improvement in the right, significant improvement in the right ankle dorsiflexion, as well as in the non-dominant shoulder AV ductors, and had preservation of strength in the dominant shoulder AV ductors, as well as in the left ankle dorsiflexors. And so this translates to the placebo group losing about 15% of the shoulder and ankle dorsiflexors after 48 weeks, and the Los Mapamod group actually showing trends of slower progression of less than a 4% decline with improvements of 12 to 27% in the shoulder of the non-dominant uh, shoulder AV ductors, as well as the right ankle dorsiflexors as compared to the placebo group. Additionally, when we take a look at the tug, um, we saw that Los Mapamod treated participants showed a trend in decreasing uh, the tug completion time as compared uh, with placebo. So when you look at Los Mapamod in orange and placebo, you can see that the Los Mapamod group gains um, about uh, a, a quarter of a second um, uh, and the uh, placebo group um, gained um, about uh, a half a second and that this left um, this, this ended up being a difference of greater than a 0.5 second uh, change from placebo, which in other trials has been shown to be clinically meaningful. So while they're both showing progression, uh, they, the Los Mapamod group is showing slower progression, and the difference in the progression is clinically meaningful. 
When we take a look at the PGIC, the trial participants who received los mapamod, we see that they are recognizing that they are improving versus placebo. Um, and here uh, in the orange, you can see that the los mapamod group uh, is showing some improvement, while the placebo group in blue is showing some uh, progression or reports of worsening, and that the difference here is 0.58. And again, this is significant in our trial, and the 0.58 difference is actually clinically meaningful as well. So when you break this down and you take a look at the participants that are showing uh, or reporting improvement versus the participants that are showing worsening, if you look at the left side here at the green bars, you can see that fewer los mapamod patients are reporting improvement as compared to placebo patients and that no placebo patients are reporting very much improved in that dark green bar at the bottom there in the Los Mapamod group. On the, on the other side, uh, for those that are worsening, you can see that more placebo subjects are reporting worsening and less Los Mapamod subjects are reporting worsening and no Los Mapamod subjects are reporting that they are mu very much worse or much worse. We did take a look at some other measures and they have yet to show any changes uh, with um, uh, disease uh, progression. Uh, we looked at the, uh, again, the FSHD tug, the motor function, as well as the FSHD health index, and we were unable to see any differences uh, between the placebo group or the Los Mapamod group. But again, these measures really didn't show progression either. Um, we did see this progression in, uh, that was captured by the PGIC. Uh, and um, perhaps maybe it would take more time to see these measures be responsive uh, to disease progression, but they were not responsive in the 48 week period that we evaluated. So in summary, you all participated in a um, voice of the patient uh, 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 event uh, last year um, with the FDA. And one of the things that you had told the FDA was that short of, the cure, short of a cure, the most meaningful thing to you for future treatment would be slowing or stopping the loss of muscle function. And you all have been involved in this journey with us. We have been asking you since the beginning, what is meaningful uh, to you? And um, trying to show you and demonstrate efficacy on the stopping or loss of function of muscle function. And so, and putting the pieces together and showing you how this fits together. You can see here, when we take a look at that ankle dorsiflexion, lifting the ankle up, that we have, um, we have slowing of fat infiltration or preservation in those um, A muscles on um, our fat metrics as measured by MRI, which translates to preservation or improved strength on dynamometry and functionally manifests itself as a slowing of progression in the, tug, uh, in the tug time. Additionally, when we take a look at upper extremity function, we can see here that, um, again, we have less fat infiltration in muscles, uh, which then again translates uh, to improvement or slowing of progression on the dynamometry or muscle, muscle strength measurement, and functionally translates to improved movement of your arm in that total surface area. So Los Mapamod ha has been identified by, uh, by us as a potential treatment or tr a transformative disease modifying treatment for FSHD. Uh, in this uh, clinical trial, Redux4, we have um, shown that, or in our, with our program, we have shown that we, Los Mapamod does in fact uh, reduce uh, Dux4 and um, we also have added um, in the Redux4 uh, data set to our safety and tolerability data set, uh, which is important that it is consistent with what we have seen uh, previously, as well as have continued to show its reliable uh, pharmacokinetics as well as pharmacodynamics or how much muscle is getting in there for clinical efficacy. But even though we have challenges measuring Dux4, in muscle needle biopsies, uh, we were able to show efficacy on structural MRI measures showing a, a, a slowing of progression of uh, fat 
uh, accumulation um, in muscles, not only in those muscles that are at high risk of progression, but in those muscles that are normal appearing and have shown improvements on functional clinical outcome measurements and how these um, are all interrelated, how these structural measures support what we are seeing with our clinical outcome measures, specifically with uh, strength and our functional measures such as reachable workspace, and that you are all recognizing the benefits you are getting with um, los map and mod treatment uh, in Redux 4. So I'd like to take a moment um, to just uh, review with you our expanded access um, policy, our EAP policy. If you have questions about our policy, you can please um, access it here and um, discuss this policy with your uh, treating physician. And we do realize here at Fulcrum that um, there is an urgent need to, to get this treatment to you. And we are working um, in conjunction with you uh, with the FSHD Society and with regulators to understand the best path forward uh, in order to bring uh, Los Mathemod uh, to FSHD patients. So we will be talking um, with the regulatory agencies uh, later this year to understand uh, how, what that path forward looks like. But our goal is um, to allow access um, uh, or limited access um, uh, uh, or have or be evaluated, um, but as, at, a, at, a, at a point where it's not necessarily disrupting or slowing down this uh, development process. All right. So um, I apologize for the... <laughs> There's, I think um, there's one other, there's this one, because this slide is actually the most important slide, Jen. I'm sorry. I apologize to everybody for my technical difficulties um, today, and I appreciate the patience of, of everybody online. I just, this is the most important slide, actually, of the whole presentation, um, and uh, it's very important that um, the team here at Fulcrum recognizes uh, the people living with FSHD, and for you all giving us your time, your muscles, um, and uh, committing to us, even in the face of a pandemic, um, uh, to Redux 4, making sure that we had the data necessary to inform these endpoints. It's unbelievable, your fortitude, uh, and, um, and we really appreciate that. I'd also like to take time to really thank the study sites, our physical therapists, the study coordinators, um, our principal investigators um, who have been led by uh, Dr. Tawil, we can't thank him um, and our site investigators as well as our clinical advisory board enough, as well as our collaborating organizations and of course our patients group and the FSHD Society. Thank you very much. All right, we have quite a few questions and just as a reminder, um, we are going to be very selective with the questions that we are able to answer. We certainly can't get to all of them, but we also um, cannot answer any questions about access, next trial, design, or plans at this time. But as soon as we have more information, there will be more information available. So I've tried to go through and summarize some of the questions because we're getting a lot of the same types of questions. So I'm just going to start to pose those to our group. And we have Anthony on the line as well, who has some questions to answer. And we'll try to get through as many as we can in the next 14 minutes. <laughs> So the first question has to do, um, obviously, with uh, Redux 4 be using the reduction of Dux 4 as a primary endpoint. And why was this uh, chosen? And um, can a primary endpoint change? Or can a trial be successful even after a primary endpoint like that is not hit? And then the follow-up to that would be, why would there be clinical benefits shown without that um, being met? So I don't know who wants to answer that first question. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Great. So uh, that's a great set of questions, probably from uh, many different questions that, that came in. So um, the story here is a long story, and I'll try to summarize it quickly. We identified um, that P, the P38 is an important uh, regulator of Dux4 expression, and we found uh, a medicine called Lismapamod, which is a selective P38 inhibitor that um, we know in our preclinical studies very effectively decreases Dux4 and Dux4-driven gene expression. And we showed a little bit of those data uh, today. Um, so looking at those uh, preclinical experiments, we asked the question, can we use this information 
um, to inform a design for a phase two study in patients. And so we looked at those data, we came up with some hypotheses, we came up with a sample size, we came up with some methods. This has never been done before. There were no data in humans before, no data in patients before, to give us a strong sense about what the uh, feasibility of this would be in a, in a long-term treatment study. So thinking that we could translate the preclinical data into this human uh, clinical trial, we chose uh, duct spore as the primary endpoint and duct spore driven gene expression. Along with that, we looked for a series of clinical outcome assessments, MRI findings to look at structure, and then patient reported outcomes with the hope that we would see some trends that would be informative for future studies that would give us some information about how well this, this drug could do in patients. What we saw, ironically, um, is the inverse. We saw that there was no change in duct spore driven gene expression in this study, but we saw pretty profound effects on these endpoints um, that impact muscle structure, function, and overall patient reported uh, potential benefit. So what we think is happening here is that indeed um, there is decreases in duct spore driven gene expression in muscles but we weren't able to see it with the biopsy technique. And there are a lot of reasons for that, some of which are biologic, some of which are technical. Um, and uh, we were pretty confident about this, mostly because of some of the target engagement data that we showed today. We know that Osmapamod is inhibiting P38, and we know that P38 has this such important role in, in mediating duct score. So based on the fact that we think that duct spore is actually decreasing, we just didn't see it. We therefore see these downstream consequences that are very relevant to, to, to people living with FSHD. Did I answer both questions or just the first one? I think you answered uh, as well as we possibly can answer now. Um, the, next, the next shift in questions was more about participants. Okay. And so folks wanted to know a little bit about who participated in the trial um, and, and how, how those decisions were made. So I'll start with, um, were these participants chosen because they were weaker or more further progressed? Or was this a pretty um, normal sample of FSHD patients? Yeah, so the inclusion criteria um, for this study, the main inclusion criteria for this study was um, those who were aged 18 to 65, they had to have a confirmed um, diagnosis of FSHD1 uh, with repeats of uh, one to nine. And they also had to have a, a stir positive muscle eligible for biopsy. Those were the main inclusion criteria. We tried to be as broad as possible. And uh, as you could see is that we got a really nice representative sample of the FSHD1 population. What we are seeing uh, for the characteristics of, um, uh, based on uh, the, the data that we have shown is that um, it, is, uh, it does reflect um, the FSHD1 population, what you would see. You actually answered several more questions in that one answer, which was great. Um, so the next question was about restrictions during the study. Did you restrict any activities that were being done or were folks just living their normal lives while they were participating in the trial? So during the study, there was no restrictions on activity except uh, prior to the muscle biopsy, patients cannot exercise uh, heavily um, 12 to 24 hours before the biopsy. And Rabi, do you want to comment on the reasons why? Yeah, I, I, I mean, if somebody exercises, um, you know, strenuously more than they, they usually do, you can have transient muscle damage that may change the, the profile of, of, of the muscle that you biopsy. But in, in general, um, I mean, we ask patients not to change their routine physical activities during a study so that it does not, it does not, um, you know, affect the results. If somebody suddenly decides to go and, and, you know, to the gym every day and exercise, that you may get a false positive response, meaning that they get stronger, but it's not because of the medication. So we want them to remain on, on their usual pattern of, of uh, physical activity. Thank you. Now looking at some of the science type questions, we want to know what is the significance of a P number? Why is it very low? Why does that make it significant? <laughs> Who would like to uh, volunteer to talk about what P values are? 
I'll leave, it. <laughs> I'll leave it to you. All right. Yeah. So, um, so the p-value tells us uh, really what is the chance that the effect that we're observing is real, and a p-value under zero point zero five, um, which is determined to be significant, it, it means that it's a very very unlikely a scenario where now by chance you will see that result. Does that help? Helps me. Yes. I hope it helps. That that's something you need to answer. I think Anthony came off mute. Go ahead, Anthony. No, no, you got it. I accidentally clicked the button, but it's. <laughs> All right. So next question is: Were MFI improvements also seen at week twenty four? So um, we actually did start to see um, improvements in MRI parameters uh, starting uh, at week. Um, 36 and at um, week 48, uh, we did look at those different time points. Um, and uh, 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 but um, the data that we showed you today, the change from baseline at week 48 includes all of the data um, from baseline to week 48. So that data that you would have seen um, at previous time points uh, is also included based on the way we analyze the data. So it's really the totality of the data. So um, what we showed you is the, actually the more precise measurement, if you will, of the change over time. Thank you. We have another one asking, um, and I'm just, I like the summary they put down is, are you certain you were looking at the right genes? Um, have those six target genes been validated as a score or readout of duct score activities? Yeah, happy to take that one. Um, so these genes are uh, commonly um, used to determine ducts for activity by the community. Um, we have um, really uh, analyzed data sets that were generated by other groups and, and, and um, really come to the same conclusions that these genes really represent ducts for activity and that these genes are not supposed to be in the muscle of um, uh, in, in any form. So, um, so we're pretty confident that these genes represent ducts for activity in that sense. Thoughts on dosing. Do you think that raising the dose would impact benefit? Or has that been thought about? Yeah, um, so we have thought about um, the dose. And uh, basically, when you're doing your clinical studies, that's one of the first questions and the questions that you always ask yourself um, when you're um, thinking about your design of the clinical trial. Um, we've thought very carefully about what the optimal dose is um, based on our preclinical data, also on our clinical data, and we've modeled out what lower doses look like um, for efficacy as well as what higher doses look like for efficacy. And what we have found based on our data is that 15 milligrams is uh, the optimal dose. Can you talk a little bit about the open label extension? Will there be additional data? Will that be continuing? Um, and will I'll ask it, even though they're asking, will additional patients be enrolled in the open label extension? So the um, open label extension study, uh, the Redux 4 is fully enrolled right now. So we are not um, uh, enrolling more patients. Um, uh, the, only those patients that, uh, that um, uh, were enrolled in the randomized control portion of the study could be involved with the open label extension portion of the study. Uh, the um, open label extension um, will continue until either we have approval uh, or until for some reason Fulcrum decides to discontinue the study. And of course, patients can always decide to discontinue in the clinical trial if they wish. So we have some questions about the, the different endpoints. So was reachable workspace difference with 500 gram weights clinically meaningful? Do you want to? I, I think when it, it, it basically it, it, it gives us a better idea of, of the improvement just based on the weight of the arm. It tells us that that person can do more um, um, uh, and have more fun functional use of that improvement in, in the surface area that he's covering or she. Um, so, it, um, and, and so the, the question again, it was, are we sure that this was a significant improvement? Is that? Yeah, clinically meaningful. Clinically meaningful. Um, <laughs> I, I think that the data suggests that. Uh, I'm not sure that we have enough information from reachable workspace to make that uh, final determination. 
but I, I don't, and, and a lot, Rich whole workspace is a, is a, a, a new outcome measure uh, and it's it's in in the development mode and we still need to know a little bit more about it, how it how it um, behaves over time in somebody with FSH. Yeah, and and recently the um, the team uh, Jay Han and his team uh, Maya Hatch also have um, just recently published an article um, showing uh, to to Rabi's point and in, in us trying to get gain further understanding of this very important endpoint. Um, the uh, the clinical importance of this measure and what they have shown is is that the measure does in fact correlate with what we call activities of daily living. So things like donning and doffing a shirt or um, that's putting on or taking off a shirt, uh, pulling on your uh, your pants, um, and that the um, the higher the measure, the more independent you are on these activities, and the lower the measure the less independent you are in these activities. And there's also have shown that this is potentially predictive of, uh, of a patient's disease course. So, um, so, so um, and uh, Rabi and his team have been um, key in uh, helping us to understand this measure more and, and to um, understand its clinical meaningfulness. Thank you for putting that to uh, real world information for everybody. I think that's the question that was being asked the final question, there's been a few that have come in just about how is this medication administered and will this be a lifelong medication or is it a one or two dose? Right, so for um, losmapamod, uh, it is the, the nice thing about losmapamod, unlike many of the, uh, the um, uh, treatments that have been developed for other muscular dystrophies, it's, it's nice that this is an oral medication that is taken uh, twice a day uh, currently, um, it appears that um, that what we're what we were, are looking at is um, in order to have the to gain the benefit is that this would be a lifelong um, uh, treatment. Um, and I'd also like to get Ruby to also comment as well as what he thinks about the the treatment. Yeah, again, I mean this is not a, a permanent fix with one dose, uh, like a, a gene therapy type of an intervention. So this, you have to keep. Um, controlling the production of DUX4, and the only way you can do that is, is continuous um, use of the medication. And I think that brings us exactly to the end of the hour, and I apologize to everybody who we did not get to. I think we tried to speed through as many as we could, um, but thank you all for all of your interactions here um, with us today. We are quite happy to be here with you today and um, look forward to future engagements where we can answer more questions. June, back to you. Yes, thank you all so much for answering so many questions and for this very comprehensive review of your data. And I'm sure this won't be the last time we'll be seeing some of you. You've been so wonderful in explaining your work all the way through the whole process and this journey continues, but this was definitely a uh, particularly memorable moment. So thank you all so much. <laughs>